Hi, I'm John Pasalis, housing analyst and founding broker at Realosophy Realty, where I lead our team of agents in providing data-driven real estate advice to home buyers and home sellers throughout Toronto and the greater Toronto area. We launched this Toronto Real Estate Summit because we we're getting a lot of questions from consumers about the volatility in our economy and our housing market that was brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're going to be talking to leading economists, housing industry leaders, personal finance experts, and real estate agents to get a better understanding of what's going on in our markets today and what are some of the key things that we should be looking for in the months ahead so you can all make smarter real estate decisions. If you have more specific questions about your home buying and selling needs, please feel free to email me anytime at askjohn at movesmartly.com. And I hope you enjoy this interview. Hello everyone, John Pasalis here from Real Philosophy Realty. Right now we have the pleasure of hearing from Carrie Taylor. Carrie runs the very popular personal finance blog, squawkfox.com. She's written 397 Ways to Save Money, a fantastic book on saving money. Uh, she's a regular commentator uh, on personal finance, on TV and in newspapers in Canada with a special focus on trying to find fun ways to make saving money exciting. So without any further delay, let's jump into my discussion with Carrie Taylor. Okay, right now I have the pleasure of talking to Carrie Taylor, who's going to talk about something that she often shares about and talks about with her readers on her very popular blog. Uh, and it's this idea of behavioral economics and how psychology can kind of lead us to make mistakes when we're trying to save money um, and, you know, predictably irrational mistakes, if we want to call them that. So I'm going to kind of turn it over to Carrie and ask her to kind of start unpacking, hopefully, some of these ideas and how behavioral economics impacts how we save. No, sure. Thanks, John. I mean, the study of behavioral economics is, is so fascinating because it helps us understand how people really make decisions in everyday life because we're really quirky and we're super inconsistent. Yeah. <laughs> and our actual decisions don't often reflect the rational decision making that we see in your standard economics textbooks. So um, behavioral economics seeks to unpack all these quirky complexities and explains to us what the heck is really going on. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I think we all have good intentions, but we struggle with making decisions that benefit us, right? Decisions about you know, diet, fitness and money. Yeah. You know, we, we know what we should do, right? We know we should exercise, we should eat a balanced meal, and we should save a portion of our income for retirement. Right? Yeah. But we struggle. So, <laughs> so the field of behavioral economics reveals all these struggles. So if anyone sees themselves in this, I don't want anyone to feel bad or beat themselves up because science shows that the struggle is real. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because I always think of myself as a as a pretty rational person. And I remember reading, you know, uh, I think it must have been Daniel Kahneman's book, who wrote, you know, Thinking Fast and Slow, who writes a lot about these these tricks our minds play and these kind of irrational things that we do. And it was kind of eye opening because, you know, as someone who kind of thinks of themselves as rational, I realize, okay, I do that, <laughs> I do that, and you don't realize all of these things that are kind of in some ways logical mistakes but we rationalize them in our heads somehow no for sure okay let, let me show you something i love that you know that i struggle with too so good. so the science of saving so this is something i struggle with okay okay what is that <laughs> <laughs> i mean i think for a lot of people it's overwhelming, I, I think, you know, I'm a numbers person. I'm like, that's a lot of numbers. I know, I, but I love this. Like I have a background in computer science. So I look at this and my brain loves it, but it's a, it's a budget spreadsheet yeah. and it's on my blog. It's super popular. It has like over 150,000 downloads. So if we look at like standard economics theory, um, standard economics would say that if everyone had a copy of this, we would use it to improve our finances and we'd make a budget. We'd stick to the budget. We'd master our money using all the data and pie charts and columns mm -hmm. and cells because you know, that's, that's the logical thing to do. Right. Yeah. And, um, and we're known for being logical with our money. 
<laughs> we're not, what did you say? We're known for being logical with money or not being yeah, logical? We're, we're not, log we're known for being not logical with our money. So yes. despite having a background in science, I know that math alone won't save us because yeah. we're not robots, right? We struggle because we're humans and we're messy. We have emotions and stresses and challenges with self-control. Yeah. Um, we're influenced by cognitive biases and we're influenced by our social networks. What's, so, I mean, if you can, um, what do you mean by cognitive biases? If you can kind of unpack what that, just at a high level, what that means for everyone who's never heard that before. Um, well, we make all these mental shortcuts. Okay. You know? So basically, um, there's a whole bunch of different ways that our brain quirks work mm -hmm. that uh, put, push us into a certain direction, which, uh, which it's hard to um, unlearn and undo. So, um, so one of these is this gap. So um, I'll show you, it's, it's the intention action gap. And I see this a lot with money. So on one end, we have our good intentions, what mm -hmm. we plan to do, you know, budget or money. And on the other hand, we have our actions and that's what we actually do. And that's, we don't, you know, <laughs> we don't actually budget our money. So <laughs> we, we say one thing and we do another. We make plans and we don't have follow through. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to, you know, uh, behavioral intentions, we look at this gap um, and it's like, how do we bridge that gap? So when I give people a budget spreadsheet, I want them to use it, but they don't use it. So it feels like a bit of a bummer, right? Yeah. <laughs> Why do you feel like people don't use it? I actually downloaded your spreadsheet. That was fantastic. Cause I remember I was trying to create a budget once and half of like, I don't want to say half, but there were a lot of expenses I hadn't accounted for because, you know, I do these mental math in my head and just pick the top line numbers and I forget all of the small things. Um, and I thought it was great that I mean, you've kind of unpacked all of these things that most people I think don't think about when they're creating a budget. So why do you think there are so many people kind of resistant to even making one? Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, well, how would I get there? Right. <laughs> there's, I'm jumping there's ahead. There's a lot of reasons, right? Okay. So, um, the challenge is, you know, how to bridge the gap. So, um, behavioral insights come into play and we look at ways to improve our decisions and turn these intentions into a reality. And um, there's a lot we can do. So I wanna share with you some of the common money mistakes we make, okay. um, why we make these mistakes and how to fix them. Mm -hmm. Because you know, there's, if we use these simple switches or nudges to improve our financial decisions and habits, mm -hmm. then um, the change can be huge. So let's look at some of the forces at play and um, so we can have the power to rethink how we actually think about our money, you mm -hmm. know, in reality. So um, one of the things I like about having a high traffic blog is I get a lot of email. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like it's a lot of email and people ask me some of the craziest questions. And one of the, um, the funny, one of my favorite things they ask is um, they ask me for permission to buy things. So dear Carrie, can I, can I buy this? You're kidding me. <laughs> I know. I love it. Cause I get like, I get like a bird's eye view of like all the weird stuff that, you know, is on people's minds and the stuff that you can buy. And, um, sometimes I reply and just say, no, you shouldn't buy that. <laughs> <laughs> but other times, um, I stop and I think, and, um, and I'm like, yeah, I should research that. Cause that's interesting. So, um, I'll, I'll research the product or the service. So, a few years ago, one of my readers emailed me and asked me about um, the Canada Goose Puffy Parka. Okay. You know, and I'd never heard of it. It's a $900 coat. Okay. And I was like, wow. So I, I, I thought I should go check this out. <laughs> so I went to the store, I tried it on. Um, I went into the change room and um, a security guard waited outside of the change room. And I was like, this is some coat, right? Yeah. So um, I, I didn't buy it. And I didn't steal it either, but I went, <laughs> I went home and I wrote about it because I didn't understand it. I couldn't understand why so many people in Toronto had this coat. Mm -hmm. And I wrote, I said, why y'all spending $900 on a coat and is it worth it? And I posted the article and I went to sleep and I woke up and the post blew up. Like it was crazy. Everyone in Canada had a, an opinions about this coat yeah. and it, it became a, a national news story. The Globe and Mail picked it up. I was doing radio and television interviews all about 
um, is this expensive coat worth it? And on one side, people said, the coat was too expensive. They said, you're paying big money for a brand. Um, it's a luxury item, totally not worth it. And on the other hand, on the other side, you had people say, this is a great coat. You get what you pay for. Um, it lasts for years. It's made in Canada. It keeps you warm. You won't regret it. So I was like, well, that's great. And the Canada-wide debate, there was thousands of comments across my website everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was fun, but looking back, it, it hit me. Everyone got it wrong because everyone fell for the same bias, including okay. me. And that's because no one thought to measure the parka's value mm -hmm. in terms of opportunity cost. Okay. Opportunity cost. Um, when we spend money on one thing, you can't spend it on another. Mm -hmm. When you spend money today, you can't spend it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Right? What's the trade off? So that $900 could have been put towards a home down payment. Mm -hmm. It could have reduced debt. It could have been, um, you could have sent yourself on a tropical vacation somewhere where you don't need a winter coat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it could have been anything other than um, a Canada goose parka. I mean, yeah. you could buy a comparable coat for less as well. Mm -hmm. So when I responded to people in email, um, they're often surprised when I suggest there are alternative ways to spend money. Mm -hmm. And we don't normally consider the alternatives because it's a quirk in our thinking. Yeah. We have a yes or no response. Worth it, not worth it. Mm -hmm. You know, thinking of the alternatives is harder, so we don't do it. Mm -hmm. So I have a strategy to help us, help us push through this way of thinking. Okay. And um, it's something I learned from my father-in-law. He's an organic cattle farmer. Okay. <laughs> and he, had, he does this really cool thing. He measures cost um, in terms of how much livestock he needs to raise to sell. So <laughs> That's wild. It is wild. And, it, and so he measures like how much things cost in terms of like cattle and hay. So in farmer currency, um, you have to sell one calf to buy two parkas, or you can sell 80 bales of hay and buy one parka. <laughs> Now this is weird, right? Yes. Like coats and cattle at like yep. a Toronto real estate summit. Totally weird. And I agree, <laughs> it's bonkers. But here's the thing, here's two things. Okay, one, we all get cold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we all buy stuff. And two, not everyone earns an income tied to time. Mm -hmm. right? That's fair. Many That's of us have our income tied to creating a product or a service. Yep. And we see a lot of this in the freelance and gig economy. Mm -hmm. which is growing, especially um, now with COVID-19, the whole economy is changing. Yeah. So maybe you sell houses, maybe you build websites or create a unique product or service. So consider how much of that widget or thing or unit of work you need to produce to determine your cost. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna see your spending decisions change because mm -hmm. suddenly you're gonna value buying a product or service differently. Mm -hmm. Now, for everyone else who earns a paycheck, you trade your time for money. So let's measure the parka's cost with the hours you need um, to work to earn it. So I'm gonna introduce you to Jesse, and Jesse is a reader of mine, and, and he works in customer service, and he emailed me because he's like, you know, should I buy this coat? And he was looking to make an informed spending decisions. So I looked at his after-tax income to help him consider the cost. And so, um, he's a new grad and after tax, his rate is about uh, $16 an hour, <clears throat> excuse me, and he works 40 hours a week. So in order to buy the coat, he needs to work 56 hours or work seven full days. Hmm. Now, you know, that's, a, that's, that's his value. So um, in terms of cost, is this worth it to Jesse? Well, he decided not to buy the coat. But is it worth it to you? Well, only you can judge that. Yeah. Well, when you go into a spending decision, um, reframe your, your thought process in terms of opportunity cost and decide if something is worth it by looking um, at what are the alternatives to buying it. Yeah. What's the trade off? And then calculate the cost in terms of your hours of work, right? Mm -hmm. And by answering this, only will you know if something is truly worth it. And hmm. by going through this, this practice, We'll no longer see something as a buy yes or no worth it not worth it but you'll mm -hmm. actually add a value to um what it means for you individually i think that's smart i mean i think it's actually 
a very clever way of thinking about it because, <clears throat> I mean, if you take um, Jesse here, I mean, buying that coat is more than 2% or so of his annual after-tax income. You know, it's like more than one week's pay, right? Um, and I think it's interesting to frame things like that because I don't think a lot of people do, but when you're, I mean, especially when you're buying slightly bigger ticket items to think, you know, that's like two or 3% of everything I'm going to make for this entire year, or I have to work seven full days to basically buy that. And I think it is interesting to think about it that way. I think it changes the, the, how you view it for sure. I, yeah, and that's the hope, right? Because then, you know, we have, um, we can slow our brain down and go, okay, you know, what's the actual value and cost? But um, opportunity cost is huge. People don't think about it. So um, I have a game. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and there's no wrong answers, John. You can answer any way you like, okay? Oh, there's, there's, there's no pressure here. No it's pressure. called, which would you rather spend? Okay. <laughs> okay, it's, it's, um, the rules are simple. You pick one. Are you into it? <laughs> I figure we've, we've done some spending, so we're good. You know, let's look at some savings. So here we All go. Right. Which would you rather spend? You get some money for your birthday or money on your paycheck? 100% birthday money. It's, uh, it's, it's like a bonus. <laughs> it's windfall That's money, right? Exactly. Okay. How about your paycheck or your lottery winnings? Well, I mean, again, obviously, your instinct is the lottery wins. <laughs> again, I have a feeling these aren't the right answers. I like, again, I like to think I'm rational, but again, I would be lying if my instinct was not the lottery winnings. <laughs> okay, you got another shot here. Ready? Okay. This is my favorite one. Which would you rather spend, your tax refund or your paycheck? Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> I, again, probably, again, you know, like I, I'd be lying if I didn't say the tax refund. Again, you think, you don't think about it. You think about it as just like money, like just fell on the street and somehow <laughs> landed in your wallet. You may as well spend it, which is completely irrational. I, I, I obviously know that. Uh, it, it basically just means I've overpaid in taxes for giving me my money back. But again, it's, you know, somehow even my you don't you don't kind of it doesn't feel like that you know it feels like you found money on the street even with the tax right. well and this reminds me i need to write an article this time of year to tell people not to blow their tax refund yeah because <laughs> that's that's like a bit the big thing but basically what i'm showing you here is um we treat different sources of money differently mm -hmm. but why right isn't all money the same because the $10 you get for your birthday can do the same thing as the $10 from your paycheck. Mm -hmm. It can be saved for retirement. It can be, it can be all spent on a splurge. Yeah. Uh, it can pay the rent. You can exchange a $10 bill for two fives and it yeah. still adds up to 10 bucks. Yeah. I think well, the you know, I, I, my instinct is the difference, at least from, I mean, again, it's irrational, but the difference for me, the way I think about it that way is that obviously my, the paycheck is kind of accounted for, right? Mm -hmm. And whereas all this other bonus stuff is not, right? And I think that's why it's actually easier to spend it, which probably just proves your point that these are just psychological biases and tricks our minds play on us. But I think that's kind of why mentally I would lean that way. That's fair. I mean, but when you think about it, all these sources of money are interchangeable, right? Like it's, it's a feature of money that um, behavioral economists actually give it a name. They call it fungibility. Mm -hmm. So every dollar is the same. You can exchange it for something else, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the retailer doesn't care if your money comes from your, um, your paycheck or from your birthday. They, they're just happy to get your money, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't care, but, but we really care. And that's because we treat money differently because we assign money to different categories. Mm -hmm. And this category controls how we think about the money, yeah. how we feel about the money, mm -hmm. how comfortable we are to spend it, yeah. and how likely we are to save it. Mm -hmm. And it's a brain quirk and um, it's called mental accounting. Mm -hmm. 
And this was, um, this was discovered by behavioral economist Richard Thaler. Mm -hmm. I mean, he won the 2017 Nobel Prize in Economics, and he's the co-author of Nudge. Mm -hmm. So um, he's written a lot about financial accounting. And it, it's fascinating because it shows how we tend to spend our windfall money yeah. easily, but act more responsibly with your paycheck money. Because like, as you said, you, you feel like it's accounted for. Mm -hmm. So the downside is um, we often make decisions on each mental account separately. And we don't really see the big picture that, you know, your birthday money, your tax refund, and your income, it's all your money, right? Yeah. But we've just broken it into different accounts. Mm -hmm. So if you find yourself splurging certain sources of money, um, like your bonus or your windfalls or your winnings or your refund, it's a good idea to pause and think about, you know, what the heck you're doing. Mm -hmm. It's all your money. It's all changeable. It's all fungible. Mm -hmm. But um, but I actually have a trick. Okay. So the upside of this, the upside of this um, this bias is we can use it for um, for good, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I use it for financial goals. So what are some big financial goals, John? Saving for a house, saving for retirement, saving for a big trip, saving for, you know. The big ones. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Those are, yeah. These are all real, right? Mm -hmm. These are all the ones my readers have as well. And we all have these money goals. Mm -hmm. But a mis big mistake many of us make is we have the goals but we don't make a plan for funding the goals. So we get back to this intention or action gap. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, people want to save for a home, but they feel overwhelmed, so they do nothing. Mm -hmm. So I have this science back strategy that uses mental accounting and it is so simple. Mm -hmm. It is so simple. Okay. So right here, right? This is a no fee bank account, which let, sorry, which lets you um, create savings goals. So I've created a house fund and I've created an emergency fund and I've created this to automatically move money from a checking account to these goals accounts. Mm -hmm. And there's a few online banks and a few credit unions that allow you to create savings goals. So I would suggest finding one that doesn't charge a fee mm -hmm. because you shouldn't be charged a fee to save money. Mm -hmm. And you can use these tools to create a dedicated uh, savings goal you can set a targeted date to achieve the goal and you can automate it by moving the money weekly or monthly. And it's so simple and it works. And if you're a gig worker, you can also, um, some institutions let you save a percentage of your income. Hmm. So, you know, if you don't have that paycheck coming in every two weeks, it's fine. It just sees your paycheck when it comes in and takes a percentage. Yeah. So yeah. for variable income earners, this still works. Mm -hmm. And, um, and what it does is it takes your mental accounts and turns them into actual accounts. So instead of having to imagine buckets of, you know, money saving goals in a big bank account, you can have them right in front of you. Mm -hmm. And it's visual. So we've taken the idea of a money goal and turned it into a visible container, which is more tangible. Yeah. And watching this money grow is highly motivating. You'll see your success. Yeah. So my friend Elizabeth did this 10 years ago because she wanted to buy a house. And um, her and her then boyfriend created just an automated account and she forgot it was running. Right? Mm -hmm. she, she looked at it one day and she had like $15,000 in there. She felt like nothing because she was so, um, she didn't have to think about it. And, and I think that was the big win is when you automate this, it enforces the habit of saving without using self-control, mm -hmm. right? Because all this self-control is exhausting. Yeah. And we tend to blame ourselves by thinking, if only I had the willpower, I could be less impulsive with our money. Yeah. Um, but forget willpower and don't beat yourself up because we're just not wired this way. Yeah. You know? when, when I first started thinking about self-control and spending, I thought people with the best savings habits had the best willpower, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I, would, I would try to encourage people. I'm like, look, impulse spending is the misfortune of the saver. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to wow. use your willpower, but I was wrong, right? Um, what I'm seeing is those people that are exceptional savers um, and have and hit their financial goals have strategies that really help them succeed. They, they do really simple things like they remove shopping apps from their phone. Mm -hmm. they, they unsubscribe from all these retailer newsletters, right? They yeah. do cash over mobile payments because the pain of paying feels like something mm -hmm. rather than just tapping all the time 
tapping your plastic. It doesn't mm -hmm. feel like spending money. So these guys, they, they actually use cash mm -hmm. and they automate their savings. Mm -hmm. So um, they also use mental accounting with their budget categories. So along with like a, a budgeting tool, like my spreadsheet, they'll create their budgeting categories in um, a savings account as well to help them stay on target. So these strategies are so simple. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not the same thing as controlling impulses. Yeah. Um, these strategies are about changing your environment, right? hundred percent. So, so if you want to create better financial habits, change your environment. Yeah. You know, so here's, here's how you do it. Um, you want to make it easy and simple. So automate everything you possibly can with your finances, especially if it's contributing to your RSP, contributing to your house fund, mm -hmm. um, you know, make it as automated as possible so you don't have to use willpower and think about it. Um, take your brain out of the equation. It'll be so much easier. Mm -hmm. You want to make it motivating and make it fun. So um, despite writing about money, I actually really hate budgeting. <laughs> I, I hate it, but I, you know, like I have a kid, I'm trying to save for RESPs, like, you know, there, there's financial obligations. So my husband and I, um, we go through our finances once a week and we make it fun by making it kind of an event, mm -hmm. right? we watch a movie afterwards, you know, maybe some couples have bottles of wine, if yeah. that's your thing, um, listen to podcasts is what we do. So, mm -hmm. you know, we make it fun um, and make your progress visible. So if you have these savings targets in your bank account, you're gonna see the money grow and it's, it's gonna feel really good. And mm -hmm. if you're doing something huge and you're saving for a huge goal, um, I had one uh, behavioral economist tell me that drawing one of those um, charts, like a thermometer chart that shows you're uh, hitting a goal closer, like you know what you see like uh, fundraisers use. Yeah. Apparently families that do that hit the mark. So I, I always laugh at these like really simple switches, but this is what the scientists are telling me to tell you guys to do. So make a chart and, and fill it in as you get closer to your goal. Um, yeah, it's super motivating. Yeah, so people with good financial habits, they put their good choices on autopilot. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to use willpower to make better decisions, right? They don't have to struggle. And, um, and bad decisions, bad habits, sorry, are really hard to break. So the latest research shows that you can succeed um, and overcome these bad habits by removing whatever triggers um, those habits from happening. So again, looking at your environment, looking at your phone, looking at your circles of influence, mm -hmm. can really change things. And I mean, this works for diet and fitness too. So, you know, um, if you're trying to eat healthy food, put a bowl of fruit on your counter. Mm -hmm. So that's less likely to reach for a bag of chips in, in the pantry. Yeah. If you, if you want to improve your fitness, put your running shoes in front of your, um, in front of your door. So you see them, it, it cues your thought process to see all oh, running shoes. I should go walk around the block. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, if you're addicted to your phone and you're scrolling through it, like I hate that. Like anything with continuous scroll is bad for your soul. Right. Yeah. You just, you kind of feel bad. So don't, you know, don't do it. Charge your phone elsewhere before bed so you don't like mindlessly uh, scroll in the morning. Charge it in the kitchen and charge it in the basement. Put it out of reach when you're trying to do work so you're not, you know, enticed by it. That's mm -hmm. changing your environment. Mm -hmm. And these simple changes just can have such a huge impact. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. It's so, really interesting. I, uh, it's interesting you say that because I've, I've found that even – Personally, I have not automated my savings. I kind of just spend less than I make. And some years I save more than other years and it's just like lump sum, I put it aside at the end of the year. Um, but it's funny because over the past couple of years, I've opened up all of these RESPs for my nieces and nephews and god kids. So I have like all of these kids that I'm, this is education that I'm trying to finance. And for the first time, I actually set up just automatic payments. And it's exactly like you say, it's hilarious. I don't notice it. It just comes automatically out of my account. I log in. So, and now all I see are like thousands of dollars in their RESPs. And I wish the kids could see them because like the idea that they have the money there gets them excited as well. Um, but it is actually, it's interesting because just automating it does just take it out of your head. It's automatic. You see it rising. 
Um, and, and it makes me feel like I should be doing this for my personal savings and not just going based on, you know, my mood in any given month, which is kind of what I do. Well, yeah, and it removes the, it removes the friction of having to decide. Like I know mm -hmm. some people struggle, but money may be in their checking account and they have to physically move it to their savings account. You don't want to do it because you start thinking about all the stuff that money could do for you today. But by taking the brain out of it, you can really save a lot of money. <laughs> so I'm just going to stop this slide share. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much for all those amazing tips. Um, many of them I could even benefit from. I think I do so great. But, uh, you know, you start listening to these things and you realize the mental mistakes. I mean, I even make, and it's kind of funny, like I said at the beginning, I often think I'm very rational but i'm clearly i mean i'm i'm clearly still vulnerable to the same types of behavioral mistakes that probably a lot of people fall into like the, this mental accounting the treating certain types of money a little bit differently not maybe entirely differently but a little bit differently than you know your salary which i think is a very common one so i think that's that's super helpful i think for for everyone to kind of get some value out of those so thanks so much for those Mm -hmm. um, so pleasure. now I think in our last maybe kind of few minutes or so, just to kind of switch gears a little bit, I thought it would be great to talk about um, something you wrote about on Twitter a while ago that really stuck with me. And I've been kind of wanting to ask you about it. It's probably been a year since you wrote it. Um, and I, and I, this is a perfect opportunity because I have you on, on, on Zoom right now. So this is great. So. Um, I remember about a year ago, I, and I'm pulling on my iPad because I'm trying to remember exactly what, what the, the discussion was about. So I think at the time, um, the CEO of CMHC, Evan Siddall, had kind of talked about how, you know, people just need to give up on the idea of home ownership and should just, you know, focus on, on renting instead. And, you know, I think I had posted a comment saying, I mean, is this really fair to be lecturing Canadians? Um, you know, just given that it's, it's not as easy as some of these policymakers sound to just give up on that and, and raise a family, rent a home and, and make that sort of, you know, um, a decision sort of long term. And I remember your, you responded, and I'm going to read it, and I thought it was fascinating. It said, I tried to, to rent in Toronto, but failed. I moved five times in five years due to property sales, rent evictions, and a crappy apartment building. As a young family, Housing security and stability is important due to dependencies like daycare and school. The cost to move was more, <clears throat> more hell since your rent goes up hundreds per month. You need first and last month rent, so roughly $5,400. Moving costs a couple thousand dollars. Time off work to pack, unpack. You may have to pay two rents in one month just to secure a place due to the shortage. So $10,000 to move. Many renters go into debt. And I thought this is fascinating because I don't think a lot of people think about that side of renting and the lack of security. So I thought, you know, this would be a good opportunity to kind of hear about maybe your experience kind of going through that. Yeah. Um, I, and I, when I said a lot of renters go into debt, I actually talked to some insolvency trustees and I'm like, Hey guys, what, what are you seeing? Because if I'm struggling with all this moving and, um, this crazy rental environment. What are you seeing? And they're, they're saying that it's the move that pushes a lot of renters into a consumer proposal um, because you basically need three months rent to, uh, to make a move because if it's a competitive environment, yeah. um, you might have to eat a month's rent in rent two places at one time. So, I mean, I, mean, I tried my best to rent in Toronto. I'm an excellent renter. You know, five times in five years with a toddler, I think yeah. deserves a medal. Because um, moving is one of life's most stressful moments. And I, it was like, by the time I unpacked my stuff, it was time to move again. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, no, it was, it was really tough. And, um, you know, we built certain dependencies in when you're a young family and you move into an area. Like, mm -hmm. we had our daycare. You know, when you move, you want to stay close to the daycare because yeah. it's really hard to find another daycare spot. Um, yeah. As my daughter got older, we had school, like she had mm -hmm. her like kindergarten, right? And to move, you, you lose your school. So 
it was a huge struggle to find a, another place in that school catchment. Um, yeah. I, I mean, moving means like just so much more than just, you know, um, finding another place, which is hard too, because you might have grandparents nearby, mm -hmm. um, other families to play with, um, you know, like it just disrupts all those dependencies. So the stress to find somewhere close to where you were, yeah. so your life doesn't get blown to smithereens is just, it's really hard. Plus, as, as I said in the tweet, it's the money you need to come up with. Yeah. I mean, who's doing all that packing? Well, I was, yeah. right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I mean, nothing, nothing's more enjoyable than, uh, than, you know, evaluating your life's choices by what you have to keep putting in and out of a box. Yeah. So it's like, I just, I wanted to throw myself and everything I owned in the garbage after move number four, because it was just, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. And it, it was out of my control. There was nothing I could do. Like, you know, our one landlord wanted to sell his house, yeah. take advantage of the hot real estate market. That's totally understandable. Um, you know, another one decided he wanted to, you know, spruce the place up and charge more rent to the next renter. You know, that's, that's kind of unsavory. So, so run um, eviction, basically. Yeah, I, I did it all, man. Wow. You know, I did it all. And then um, our first apartment, we couldn't get a two bedroom. So we had a, a one bedroom and, um, and, you know, with an 18 month, oh, she was 18 months at the time. It was pretty early on. We discovered that when you have young kids, you eventually want to put them in their own room and close the door. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like we need, <laughs> I'm like, go into your room. I need some time. Um, you know, so it, there's not a lot of options for rentals because we see the market, you know, changing so rapidly with, you know, what Airbnb has done and, yeah. um, you know, the, the heat of the, the housing market, it was really a, an uncomfortable place to be yeah. and to have someone say, you know, give up the dream of having a stable place to live. Um, it, you know, I can see why you were irked by that because yeah. I worked too, right? Like eventually you just want a place to like, you know, put pictures on the wall as you want to do it. Right. So I'm just so tired of moving. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one of the challenges in Canada. It's that I, I don't think they've, and, and that's what does irk me. It's because, I mean, at the end of the day, for, for renting to become a reality and a, a reasonable option for a lot of people, a lot has to be done federally, provincially to, you know, to have some security for people who want to make it sort of a long-term home. And I guess the only option really or alternative i guess is just renting in a purpose-built rental because that's kind of the only place where um it's at least harder to get kicked out of you know i think some landlords are starting to have a bit of a, a bad reputation for run evictions themselves um you know so you don't even avoid it there but i think that's the only potential option but again how many you know how many you know purpose-built rental buildings are there um, we haven't built any for a very long time. And, and again, they're not always in the right area. So they have sent family sized units. You know, I think there's a lot of challenges. Um, and, and I think your experience kind of just really brings that all together and why um, it's hard to make renting an option, especially for a, you know, a family with kids. And, and when you have these considerations like school, um, you know, how do you make it all work when you have to move every year or two? Right. And I mean, with the, we, we lived in a purpose uh, built rental and oh, again, like the, yeah, the first time when we had the one bedroom and, um, and that was hard because there wasn't a lot of, you know, daycares or schools around that, you know, had still had spots available because it was such a, you know, large amount of people living in a small, you know, geologic, uh, region so, so how did um, they kick, how did they kick you out then if you're coming in because in theory in ontario we didn't, you, kicked out. We didn't no we oh, didn't you um, just we, needed more space we needed more space ah, okay and they didn't have a two-bedroom available right I see. Mm -hmm. so we couldn't stand it anymore so we rented uh we moved out and got house right you just can't like we had yeah. like a two-year-old like storming up the walls in this small little one bedroom so uh Mm -hmm. Or else we would have stayed probably if we got a two bedroom, but eventually, you know, if I, I was, I was, I work from home. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's hard, you know, and. So what advice would you give then to a renter 
if any, who wants to rent potentially, but try to avoid kind of what you went through? I mean, are there any, I guess, things in hindsight you'd say, okay, this is what I think someone should do that's in my shoes if they want to rent? Yeah, purpose rental is number one on the list, mm -hmm. uh, definitely, because you'll have more um, uh, security, because yeah. you're, again, like you said, you're less likely to have a specu lord. Um, but I mean, there are like old time landlords out there that have owned their property for a long time mm -hmm. that aren't looking to run evict people because they want to hold on to their house as an asset. They're professional landlords. Yeah. So if you can find a professional landlord who takes this as a very serious business transaction, who mm -hmm. cares about their tenants, yeah. um, then that's, you know, that's the ideal situation you can find if you don't have a lot of apartment buildings meant for renting in your area yeah. um and you know you can you can find them because they've been in business for a long time they didn't buy during the crazy height to you know try and maximize yeah. you know, the investment um you know they're looking for long-term tenants and they're not looking to you know kick you out and boot up the rent so um find a professional landlord and they're out there and they're good people and um it's their business plan to, you know, provide shelter for people that pay for it. So, yeah. you know, it's possible, yeah. um, but it's also possible to find, you know, the bad apples that when the market heats up, they, their house is, you know, their speculation and they're ready to sell. And they forget yeah. that there's laws and rules for the people actually living in that house, paying the mortgage. So yeah. um, that can be a very frustrating thing. So, I mean, I had one landlord that had no idea that there was a landlord tenant act, right? So <laughs> I'm like reading through this thing and I'm like, dude, I don't think you can kick me out with a month's notice, right? So you want to know someone, you want to rent from someone that knows the rules. <laughs> yeah, no, it, I agree a hundred percent. I mean, the, the one positive thing I think in the past, since you probably were here and went through that, it's a lot harder for landlords to kick out tenants now for their own use, which is basically what every landlord would do. Uh, you know, they'd rent it out for their own use, you know, kind of live in it for a month or two, during which time they just happen to spruce it up and renovate and either sell it or rent it at a higher price. And that was technically allowed because um, there was no limit on how long the landlord had to live there. That could have been a month. It could have been six weeks, right? Mm -hmm. so now they've basically changed it. So it's a lot harder for landlords to kick tenants out. They have to occupy for a year. They have to give you one month's notice penalty. So there are a few laws that have changed that I think have, and I think they're positive. You know, I think it's, you, you don't want, you know, I am a landlord. You want people to be acting ethically. You know, I don't, I don't believe in, you know, our buildings like rent control. I have no problem with that. Like let the tenants stay there as long as they want. I don't, I don't like, these landlords who are just trying to kick people out every year to, to jack up the rents. I think it's terrible. Um, but so at least we have some of those policy changes in Ontario that hopefully make it a little bit more, you know, viable for some, for some people in the future, even if they're renting small apartments. But I agree with you on your comment on the landlords. I think it's something that I think a lot of people, especially in a market, they don't, that's so competitive. They don't think about vetting the landlord as well. And I think it's a huge, because again, it's your, your, it impacts your relationship. You know, you kind of get a good sense for, is this a responsible person or something breaks, you're going to fix it. Um, you know, and, and how difficult are they going to be? Cause you are getting into a relationship. So I do think it's important for, for people who are renting to sort of think about that and not just rush into it because the place is amazing because yeah. it might not be a great experience. Yeah, no, for sure. And I mean, um, I got much better at vetting the landlord at my final move. And uh, he was a great guy. I mean, when, when things went south in the house, it was an old house, he was there and fixing it because that's his property, right? He cares about his house. Mm -hmm. He cares about his tenants. And, and as a renter, you should be interviewing the landlord just as much as they interview you, yeah. right? Because while you may be stuck in a, in a hard spot because you need a place to live, you don't want to be stuck in a harder spot living in a bad place to live. Yeah. So, um, you know, you know, do, do some research, ask the questions and, and, you know, go on some of the forums, see what people have to say about the local um, landlording and uh, rental market. There's plenty of forums where you get quite a bit of information as to what your rights are, learn yeah. those. And, yeah. um, 
you know, and uh, get a place you can afford. That's the worst thing ever is when it's, it's too much. A hundred percent. That's great. So I'm going to, we're going to wrap up right now. I'm going to, we're going to wrap up. I have two last questions for you that oh. we're they're asking everybody in our summit. So the first question is um, that the theme of our conference is smart caution. And I'm just curious what smart caution means to you personally. Oh my goodness. Smart caution. You're just, throwing these questions at everyone, right? <laughs> well, I mean, what comes to mind, I guess, given this, this volatile kind of market that we're in, I think we're trying to think about, you know, how can people make smart decisions, but, you know, proceed cautiously without, you know, kind of trying to mitigate the risk. So just, you know, what does it mean, I guess, to you to... Right. I think if we slow down, like we kind of live in this world where everyone just kind of, you know, does things without pause for thought. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, pause for thought, have more empathy for people. Like, yeah. you know, like, look at this environment we're in. Like, mm -hmm. this is strange, right? Um, I think we get a lot further in life if we have more empathy for other people and we have more understanding for those around us. Yeah. Um, um, sorry, what was the, the, it was smart caution? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I think more empathy. I just I see the world, you know, what's happening with COVID and, you know, the inequality. And it's like, listen, yeah. Yeah. you don't always have to have an opinion. Just yeah. listen, listen a lot more. And I think we get further ahead if we can hear what other people have to say. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. And I'm going to ask you one last one and then we're done. <laughs> being a real estate focused summit would you buy or sell a home right now oh my goodness <laughs> yeah but i'm also like I, I just like my brain just went through like how much money do i have in the bank can i afford a down payment <laughs> what's the stress test look like you know like this is where my brain is going um you know what um I don't know if I needed a house and I had, you know, in the, and I could afford it and I had saved up for it. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Um, <laughs> you know, like, I feel like if, if you're in the market, you need a house, um, you know, look at the opportunity cost of not <laughs> buying a house, <laughs> look at, you know, what different, you know, areas you can buy at. Sure. Um, I, I say, why not? Um, if you're not ready, then it's a good time to save. Right. Yeah look at your employment like is your employment secure right now yeah like, those are you know you know don't let like the desire of seeing a nice looking property sway you you gotta yeah. sit down and say do i need a house do i want a house am i gonna live there for a good amount of years mm -hmm. um, can i afford the payments um you know and if you have a family or you need a place to live then then start looking at your options why not <laughs> mm -hmm. that's awesome well, thank you so much. Thank you for all your great insights and for taking the time to chat with me today. I think everyone's going to get a lot of value uh, out of your thoughts, uh, both on your experience as a renter and on all of your great insights on, on how to save and, and thinking about all of these, these mental tricks that uh, kind of make it harder for many of us, including myself, to even save. So thanks so much, Carrie. Thanks, John.